to LBC and ask your question that way. You can, of course, watch us also on Global Player. To my left is Heather Wheeler, Conservative MP for South Derbyshire, former government minister. To her left is Nick Thomas-Simmons, Labour MP for Torvine and Shadow International Trade Secretary. To my right, Baroness Claire Fox, non-affiliated peer and director and founder of the Academy of Ideas Think Tank. And Christina Patterson, writer and broadcaster and author of the book Outside the Sky is Blue. They are here to take your calls. It's your agenda. I don't ask the questions. You ask the questions on 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, when I say I don't ask the questions, I might I might throw in the odd one along the way. Uh, Robbie in Chelmsford is our first caller. Robbie, what would you like to ask? Good evening, all. I would like to know, do you think all free speech is important or just the voices that we agree with? Yeah. And what, what are you... Are you referring to anything in particular here? Oh, well, I couldn't possibly say, but um, one, uh, G. Lineker of Leicestershire today has created some controversy, and I'd be interested to know if the panel believe that his free speech is as important as uh, any other voice. Well, this is Gary Lineker, who tweeted, I think, was it yesterday or this morning, about um, likening what the government have announced on small boats to events in Germany in the 1930s. And as you can imagine, that's created quite a stir. Um, Nick Thomas-Simmons, let's come to you first. Of course, free speech is uh, an extraordinarily important principle. I mean, we've always, historically, there, there are certain things, of course, that if people cause harassment, alarm or distress to other people, where the law does intervene, so that there is a line in that respect, but it's hugely important that we do have free speech across our society. With regard to Gary Lineker specifically, that certainly these are not uh, words that, that I would have used, but I think anything with regard to what action the BBC seeks to take is a matter for the BBC, and I don't think that politicians charging in is necessarily helpful with that but do you think given given his public profile it, it, in a sense it doesn't really matter whether he works for the bbc or is a, is a presenter of a sports program or, or current affairs program um but does it matter more what he says and how he says it rather than if robbie from chelmsford rings into my show and gives a view and says the same thing are, are, are we operating by different standards there well D different Not that I'm saying Robbie isn't as important as Gary Lynn. Uh, Robbie's opinion is, is very important, and I'm delighted he, he's phoned in. But I, I also think, of course, people have different platforms, Ian, don't they, within our society. People are better known than others. People have particular perspectives, particular areas that, that they can comment on. The BBC has, has operated this distinction between those who work in news, current affairs and politics shows uh, and others. Uh, and I think that is a matter for them. I think they've uh, indicated today that they will be uh, speaking to Gary Lineker. I think it's, it's for them to Just as they've action. done on about 10 occasions previously. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and indeed with, uh, with with other presenters too mm. at different times. Now, Claire Fox, if, if Mastermind came and calling, this would be your specialist subject, wouldn't it? Uh, it's a great question, Robbie, actually, because one of the things that really disturbs me is that even on my side, the people who say that they're the kind of free speeches, that there is a trend to want to cancel the cancellers. <laughs> and I, I, it, despite the fact that I found that what Gary Lineker said was completely revolting, because actually it's a great... It's actually an insult to the British public in a way or anyone who's asked any questions about the small boats or, or so on because it implies that we live in this, you know, Nazi-like atmosphere. And he's got on my nerves an awful lot over the uh, uh, recent years in terms of his political commentary, which he does all the time, by the way, was particularly hostile in relation to Brexit. But I'm not going to call for somebody to be sacked, right? There's a different question that we might come to on impartiality in broadcasters. I think that's a question of ethics and, and broadcasting standards. I get that. But I, I just get very nervous when people say, um, because I don't think that free speech is some sort of nice little abstract principle even. I, I think it's the cornerstone of democracy. For me, it's the core thing. You can't have open debate in democracy. And what people will say is, I support free speech, but not for that because it's too hateful or too offensive. And you think, well, what you're basically saying is I support free speech for inoffensive speech. Mm. You have to support the free speech of even the most reprehensible vile speech, and particularly that which you don't agree with, it seems to me. Otherwise, you're just being 
But it you're, isn't you're selling part, out the principle. Isn't part of the problem here that everyone draws a different line in the yeah. circle? Mm. Yeah. And for example, there are people who I regard as so beyond the pale, I won't have them as guests on my programme. No, but that's an editorial... I've made yeah. that as an editorial No, that's choice. an editorial decision. But, right? but I have effectively silenced No, them. no, I know, but that's an editorial decision. I think where we get into difficulties is when uh, somebody else has them on a programme, if you were then to start trying to campaign to get them, the programme closed down. Mm. And that's what's happening on university campuses, isn't it? That's what's yeah. happening everywhere. People get invited whose views you can't stand or you think are go over your line. I mean, extremists is, like Amber Rudd. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> no, but, but, but there, are, there are people who are invited that I think, why did you do that? I mean, I organised the Battle of Ideas Festival, and like you say, you know, I, don't, I don't go, oh, yeah, I believe in free speech, I'm going to invite Katie Hopkins, and I'm going to invite, uh, I don't know, Tommy Robinson. Well, I, it, it, nobody has a right to speak or to demand that, they're sp that yeah. they speak, but if they are invited, and we're talking about a social media situation here where you know what it's like, there's kind of pylons, you know. I mean, people will, <laughs> it'll happen after this programme, they'll say to you, why did you have her on? Her views are beyond the pale. Happens every time I'm on this no, programme no, or just, anywhere I've, else. I've just they're on now. Yeah, yeah, she's in beyond already. the pa pale, <laughs> all sorts of horrible... Who funds her think tank? <laughs> yeah. Nobody at the moment. I've got no money, and if there's anyone out there who wants to help me fight for the cause of anti-censorship, then do contact me. Um, Perhaps Robbie can help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Robbie, are you on? Chris, yeah. Christina Patterson. Now, um, I'm sure you must have written about this subject many times in the past. What's your view on Robbie's question? Well, I think you're absolutely right, Ian, that everybody draws the line at a different point. And also... The law states that there are lines that can't be crossed. So we have something called hate speech and the law determines what that hate speech is. I don't think anybody should be worrying too much about uh, Gary's free speech because um, he's in a separate category, which is a category of celebrity. And he's not there as a BBC presenter. Of course, he is you know, extremely expensive and highly valued. But he wouldn't have the profile had he not been a BBC presenter. No, that's, presenter. Tr that's and he's, true. I don't that's know how many true. followers he's got on Twitter, but uh, it's a multiple I mean, of mine. Enormous, but I don't think, you know... People follow him on Twitter for his politics, but they don't watch him on telly for his politics. And I think, um, I don't think he's in the same category as presenters of Newsnight or the Today programme or whatever. And as we know, people who felt curtailed by the BBC commitment to neutrality, a number of them have left recently and forged, you know, very successful careers mm -hmm. in other places. So um, this one, <laughs> exactly. I think, I think it's. Look, I, of, of course there will be issues like this which are highly emotive and no doubt somebody else will call in and want to discuss the nuances and details of this particular issue. I'm sure that all of us sitting around this table believe in free speech, but it is a question of where you draw the line. I mean, at the moment, if you dare to criticise, say anything negative about Harry or and Megan, as I did on a TV programme on Saturday night, you will spend the next few days drowning in abuse in relation to that. Similarly, on the trans issue, this is the price we pay for living in a free society and speaking out about these things. And it's not much fun to be drowning in that abuse, but, you know, it's a relatively small price for freedom. Gary Lineker, I'm told, has 8.7 million Twitter followers. I have 270,000. I feel so <laughs> inadequate. Well, I have I'm a three. lot more inadequate than you then. <laughs> Can I just, just one just tiny clarification? Because I think when you say, you know, we've got laws about hate speech, I mean, now that I spend a bit of time looking at laws, one of the things you can say is that nobody can agree what that mm. hate speech mm. is because yeah. you might think, we all, we all think we all know what we mean. But I mean, I would say that actually Gary Lineker's tweet was hate speech. I'm just not trying to ban it, right? Because I thought it was pretty hateful about what he was saying. But it's just that... You made the point about trans, and I'm not going to, into that issue. Yeah, that but no, madness. no, no, but I'm making the point that if you argue for women's rights on International Women's Day in a particular way, you're going to be accused of hate speech and bigotry yeah. by a certain group of yeah. people. Mm. And so we go on. So my point is, we've all got different lines, which is therefore why I say absolute free speech, and it's a price worth paying, even if we get a lot of abuse. I, I thought International Women's Day had actually been renamed to International People with Cervixes. Well. <laughs> oh, very probably good. is. It probably <laughs> is. In some people's <laughs> Oh, I'm going to get so much hassle for that, aren't so I? So am um, I. So we're going to get more than you, Ian. Heather Wheeler. Tell you. Um, I'm unbelievably annoyed about uh, the tweet. I think he shouldn't have done it. I think he genuinely is abusing his position as uh, a BBC employee. 
I really, really do. Even though he's presenting on sport and not current it, it, affairs. It doesn't matter because he knows that he's putting it out there, not for the people that are interested in watching um, 22 people run up and down plus the bloke in the middle wearing black. You know, they, he's, he's That's not... very bro- interesting to he's, watch. He's not man. broadcasting to that. <laughs> he's not broadcasting to those people. He's broadcasting um, as a celebrity having a political point of view. Well, do it off the dime of the BBC. He was doing it. I mean, he wasn't doing it. It was nothing to do with the BBC. He was doing it on Twitter. That's a separate, one could argue, currently not terribly pleasant uh, mark, uh, sort of, you know, town he, square. He's paid for by the public purse. Well, he does. Know? He's paid for by a lot of people. But, I mean, surely free speech is important to everybody. What? Why should somebody who isn't a political interviewer, um, journalist, why shouldn't they be entitled to express their opinions? Well, they are, but... He's actually paid by the public purse. That's the problem, isn't it? Um, and so, you know... He's, go, pay, go. he's paid to present a football programme by I the know, public I know, but purse. you know and I know that he... I, I, well, I can. I'm repeating myself, so I apologise. But I, I, I just think that um, he, he's overstepped the mark for somebody who is paid by the public purse. Um, follow-up text question here from Andy and Taunton. He says, was Rishi Sunak being hateful in saying Keir Starmer is on the side of people traffickers, mm. which we talked about a little bit in the last hour, which I thought was a completely reprehensible thing for him to say. I get the cut and thrust of PMQs, but nobody seriously believes that Keir Starmer is on the side of people traffickers. So why say it? The um, amount of uh, interventions by lawyers to stop um, the route of the government to stop the little boats coming over has been absolutely astonishing. The um, upside is that the people traffickers carry on being people traffickers. If the if the Starmer lawyers... was prosecuting when yeah. he was DPP. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. And um, did you not it... wince when you heard that? I, to be fair, I didn't actually hear it at all because right. the noise in the chamber was so big. I didn't actually hear it at all. Are you are you wincing now when I when I talk when I ask you about it? Because I would I would have been embarrassed to be a Conservative MP watching that. The um, as you say, the cut and thrust in the chamber is is what happens. Right, very briefly, Nick. Uh, that that comment was completely wrong, and anyone who'd seen what Keir Starmer has done in his career, including as director of public prosecutions, when actually he was the one giving the instructions, giving the orders in that position to prosecute people smugglers, would would know that it was completely factual. Right? There's an absurd thing for the Prime Minister to say. But but Ian, I just came running over from the Lord's repeat statement on this, on the issue of the boats. And I actually got quite exasperated with both sides, I have to say. Um, I d- it's not that I think, oh, the to- you know, the toxic language, but I thought everyone is, a co- you know, this is a really serious issue. So what you've got is, in this instance, it was the Labour Party want open borders, which is just not true. Um, I don't think they do want open borders. I think, however, they are not helpful in the way that they put up blocks of what needs to happen. But on the other hand, you then had the Labour Party saying, uh, you know, some people from the Labour Party saying that uh, the problem was Suella Braverman's rhetoric that caused a crisis and was fueling xenophobia and, and, and hate. So then I started Fair thinking... comment, isn't it? No, because what I'm saying is... I, I'm saying that it's actually hateful to be in a situation... What's happened is the British public, perfectly reasonably, are fed up with being told that you can't stop or you can't control your borders, right? And so there is a danger that we are going to undervalue the meaning of what refugees mean, the meaning of what asylum means, even the meaning of what modern slavery is, if you keep saying to people, everybody in those small boats are um, genuine and that no, anyone you're, who criticises them you're right, is uncompassionate, but, but when, inhumane. That's an insult. But when you have a Home Secretary people. who tries to imply that 10 million people are seeking to come to this country, she actually said it in those terms yesterday, I, then, I mean, that, that was... Pure dog whistle politics. What, what I'm sa- no, I'm saying to you, there was dog whistles all over the House of Lords from all sides. That's what I'm trying well, to dog, say. Well, dog whistles you, are in the ears of the beholder. No, but if they? you accuse the British public effectively of being inhumane and lacking compassion, I don't think anybody did accuse I, the British I'm, public of being inhumane I'm and lacking compassion. And the fact is that actually, I'm the British public, the, the British public, no, I think you're wrong, and I think the British public cares much less about small boats than the politicians. No, 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 no,
I'm not in. I'm. I'm. In, I think the system is is absolutely disastrous, and I think it does enable the people smugglers. And I think the fact that most of the people coming over <coughs> on small boats are male and under the age of forty shows how totally unfair the system is. The system doesn't work. Labour, no, it doesn't work. The Tories, no, it doesn't work. But it is not people's top priorities, according to an Ipsos poll. Eighty percent. It's it's uh, the economy, the NHS, inflation. Those are the things people care about. Twenty percent for twenty percent of people was it their top issue? And Rishi Sunak has set himself it's up. Quite a lot of people. Yeah, it's I'm not it's also it it's not matter. I'm not saying yeah. it doesn't matter. I think it does matter. Mm. I think people like fairness, and I think it's an unfair system that enables criminals to make money, uh, huge amounts of money, in a way that brings the wrong people very often into the country because there are many, often many more deserving cases. <laughs> But, right. I think, but I think that it's not fair to say that the British people are, are being I'm, hateful. I'm saying, that, I'm saying they're being gaslit mm. as being, mm. being told these are people fleeing war and persecution. That was what was happening. And I was saying, well, they're perfectly right to a question, as you've just done, without being accused of being inhumane and not caring and being okay. xenophobic. We're going to move on. Robbie, thank you for your opening question. Thanks to Andy for the tax question as well. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel, 0345 606. 60973. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. tuned in. Uh, on our panel we have Nick Thomas-Simmons who is Shadow International Trade Secretary for Labour, Heather Wheeler, Conservative MP for South Derbyshire, Christina Patterson, writer and broadcaster and Baroness Claire Fox, non-affiliated peer. Um, your book, Outside the Sky is Blue, great title. Tell us more. Oh, thank you. It's a, a family memoir. Um, my family, unfortunately, are all dead now, both my parents and both my siblings, and I've been wanting to write it a long time for a long time before they all died. Um, it's about, probably the main thing is my sister had schizophrenia and that had quite a big effect on us all and I developed all kinds of weird illnesses and so on, and which makes it sound... 
utterly miserable, like a child called it or something, but it's actually <laughs> in, in lots of ways quite a joyful and cheery book. So um, uh, people who've read it, it had lovely reviews and people who've read it have really liked it. So thank you for asking. Not at all. Just Outside the sky is blue. Back, by the way. <laughs> Great. Well, everyone should buy it. Thank you. Right, let's go to our next caller. It's Darren in Camberwell. Hello, Darren. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm just phoning um, to ask, do you think um, reparations should be paid to the Caribbean and should the royal family contribute? Um, Claire? No. <clears throat> um, I, no, I do not think reparations should be paid. I think that there's a, a really um, regressive trend at the moment, which is to try and almost plunder the pain of of what happened to people in the past and historically to explain some of the problems of today and I think that the, the truth of uh, reparations would be that nobody alive today in the context of this particular kind of slavery is a slave owner or is guilty No, but the argument is that, that families that benefited from the compensation at least that was provided or indeed dur during the period they their descendants still benefit from it, and Britain as a country no, still but I, benefits but I from think, it. But I think it's, we've, we've looked at one particular thing in relation to slavery. My, my point, I suppose, is a bit broader than that. I could sit here and say, well, you know, my family were the victims of the famine, right? Um, as it happens, and the rest of my family who are from Wales, with the, you know, they certainly suffered under, you know, people being beaten up because they were speaking Welsh, but you could go on for a long time. And it's like, sort of, you could queue up. So there is something about demanding a recognition and then demanding m monetary, uh, 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 you know, reward, is it not reward, compensation. And I think that actually it doesn't allow us to build a new society where we have equality, but it makes us go back bitterly fighting arguments that actually none of us can take full responsibility for. It's punitive, it's unpleasant, and I actually think that it's a very... Uh, that's a really divisive way of looking at the world, and I don't think it helps us understand history But either. you've got the Trevelyan family uh, who were involved in the slave trade, apparently going to the Caribbean, apologising for their family's role in it, and offering themselves to pay some sort yeah. of compensation. It's be because it's become quite a... It's become quite fashionable to do so. I mean, I, I understand. I mean, it's like the it's like the sense in which people feel, or oh, maybe I should say sorry, and everybody's rather defensive and so on and so forth. All I'm saying is, is that in every single instance, everybody who is rich, right, and I'm not, everybody who's rich will have exploited somebody along the lines, right? And, and do you see what I mean? Like, the, everybody who's rich in this country, they will have exploited the... the, the uh, British working class along the lines, you know what I mean, sent kids up chimneys and so on and so forth. And I'm simply saying that I think that these were the horrors of the past. There are plenty of injustices and horrors going on today I want to fight. And I'm concerned about our plundering history for the pain okay. of the past to... It, it's um, a distraction to me. Heather, you were a Foreign Office Minister. I don't know whether this came up during your time there, but th it's been brought up today by Clive Lewis, uh, one of Nick's colleagues on, on the Labour benches. Um, he thinks it's certainly something that we should be talking about and probably acting on. What do you think? No, I think he's completely wrong. And I think um, it's almost like moving the dial on the next area of woke. So what should we do this week? Oh, right, I know. We'll do reparations this week. I genuinely, you know, that's not a, a, a throwaway comment by me, I just think that it's just astonishing. I mean, do you remember Cameron stood up and Mr. Cameron stood up and and did an apology for the potato famine uh, in in Parliament. Um, and when I was in the Foreign Office, we've done a, a, an apology to um, uh, the indigenous people that Captain Cook fought against when he found New Zealand. Well, as it happens, one of the uh, captains that was killed in that skirmish was a relative of mine. I don't remember anybody apologising to my captain, but, um, you know, that's another story. You can imagine the Foreign Office were well chuffed with that. Sure, surely we should, we should accept our role in history, whether it was glorious or whether it wasn't. And it's quite legitimate for people in the Caribbean to have a view that, well, um, we, we think that there is a case to answer here. I don't agree at all. I genuinely don't. I think um, history is history, and uh, I, 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 okay. I find it's just a, a, another thing to just have a go at. Christina. 
Uh, this one is so difficult. I just don't know how to answer it. I think we do have a responsibility towards uh, the Caribbean. You know, the legacy lives on in so many ways. I put, I wouldn't know how you would begin to put sums on it. And I personally think that's probably a impossible to do and be not going to happen and I think the much better legacy would be to ensure that our society is as equal as equitable gives equal opportunity to people from as many backgrounds as possible I mean I live in Hackney it's one of the most diverse boroughs in London I absolutely I've lived there for nearly 25 years it's one of the things I love about London is the fact that it's a very culturally and racially mixed society but you know and of course Britain has made great progress since um since the Windrush and um, obviously the, the actual Windrush scandal is a whole other thing but mm-hmm. since those early days of immigration um, particularly from the Caribbean Britain has made great strides but it has a very long way to go and I think we should be focusing on our country on our population in terms of how we deal with the legacy of, sh- of slavery there. Nick? I think this is about finding a, a way forward in the present and Uh, You've mentioned, Ian, some individual families who've benefited from the slave trade in the past have chosen themselves individually to go and make particular recompense. There are areas, too, of injustice. I think, for example, of where there are convictions in place for slave rebellions in the past where we could uh, offer pardons, and there may be particular cases where that's very helpful. But I also think, too, I was at the Commonwealth Investment uh, Summit in recent months, and I do think we've neglected the Commonwealth as a forum in our foreign policy. And I think there is great, there are things we can do now, whether it is around uh, aid, whether it is around trade, but also what are the challenges in the present that we can actually lead across the world in, whether it is in well, this could be tackling climate change. No, but that I mean, reparations could be one of them, because it's not, it wouldn't just apply side. to us. I mean, you, you look at the role of the French, the Dutch, many other countries in this, it's not just Britain. Why shouldn't Britain take a lead? That's what Cli- your colleague Clive Lewis is saying. I understand that, and, and there are, as I've said, particular families who, who've taken that view in respect of the Caribbean. What I am saying is that we have to look collectively at how we can move forward in the present. I'm not sure how helpful uh, that language is. I think what it is about for me today is slavery, of course it has this legacy of deep inequality, but that is something that working together we can tackle <coughs> in the present as well as, as I've said, I've just given climate change as an example, but poverty is another example of things we can do to find a consensus way forward. But if family... You know, I find this unbelievably difficult. I mean, I I had the pleasure of just recently going to Zanzibar. I mean, that was like the capital of where the slaves were taken through. You know, where did these people come from? Who was selling them? You know, we didn't invent this, did we? We might have taken advantage of it, but we didn't invent it. So are you going to go back to the people from Zanzibar and say, we want reparations from you? I mean, this is where this gets nonsense. Somebody here is saying Anglo-Saxons were slaves of the Normans. Who's going to pay for that? I mean, I said earlier that you could argue that Britain should approach Denmark for reparations for the way the Vikings raped and pillaged their way through the country. I I mean, it is a can of worms, but I I think it's a debate which I I suspect is going to go on and on, but not on this programme for now, because we're going to change the subject in just a couple of minutes' time. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. Let's get the news headlines at 8.30 with Andy Ivey. Wintry weather is expected to cause more travel disruption over the next two days. An amber warning for heavy snow is in place from tomorrow afternoon in central England in an area stretching from Stoke-on-Trent to Durham. The Liberal Democrats say serious questions have been raised about the conduct of the Tory MP Steve Brine following claims in leaked WhatsApp messages. There are calls for him to step aside from chairing the Health Committee while allegations are investigated that he lobbied the head of the NHS in early 2021 on behalf of a firm he was working for as a paid consultant. The Prime Minister has accused Sakir Starmer of seeking dis- to disrupt the government's plans to stop small boat crossings. But the Labour leader says if Mr Sunak thinks the latest crackdown will work, he's deluded. LBC weather, sleet and snow across Wales, the Midlands and East Anglia overnight, a low of minus five. Tomorrow, cloudy with occasional rain across southern England, rain spreading north and turning to snow across central areas, a high of six. This is LBC. Port-
We have Nick Thomas Simmons, Heather Wheeler, Christina Patterson, and Claire Fox with us answering your questions. Here's a text question from Pauline in Watford, who says, Is the NHS offering weight loss jabs for two years to unwell obese people while not bothering to regulate how healthy processed foods are uh, how healthy processed foods are and teach better cooking in schools? Just another expensive sticking plaster for this issue. Well, we have four fine figures of people here who wouldn't <laughs> need to have these jabs. Um, Christina, let's come to you. Um, well, look, we were just talking about our love of crisps. Yes, we were. That's what we talk about in the breaks, our love of crisps. Um, and, you know, I have zero self-control when it comes to crisps, so I'm not going to le lecture anyone else on their eating habits. I actually think that this drug, there was a, a very good piece by David Aronovich at the weekend about um, trying... The sadly, about there. to depart the Times. I know, inexplicably. very, very sadly, and absolutely inexplicably, because I think he's yeah, one of the too. most brilliant columnists. But... Um, I think it's. I think the NHS is right to fund this this um, a jab. I mean, the fact is, I think the projections are that by 2035, something like 50% of the population will be obese. Which, I mean, it's not just the the cost to the NHS, the cost to their own lives in terms of serious long-term and chronic illnesses is enormous but the cost of the NHS is enormous and we are not going to be able to fund an NHS that um, has to deal with that level of chronic illness so it seems to me that um, I mean two years of of these funding these jabs is probably worth doing and if it helps people they're not get their cheap i gather control, I, I haven't got the figures here but well i, they, they I don't expensive. think they are cheap but i think they're a lot cheaper than funding the the long-term consequences but what about personal responsibility surely we should all be responsible for well, what we put in our bodies um it's more complicated than that because we do um live in you know what uh doctors like to call an obscenogenic environment and and it's the case that unfortunately at the lower socio-economic end of the spectrum cheap food is uh, food that's highly processed it just is much cheaper you know i live on a high street i go to the iceland a lot um i also pile my uh trolley up high but you know probably with slightly healthy with, with, with things with mccoy's crisps no i'm afraid i like the posh of france but, uh, <laughs> oh, but, oh, for, for me that's posh <laughs> no, which one did you say McCoy's. oh yeah no they are they are good but anyway i won't name the brands because i'm not going to give them yet more free advertising but i don't think it is of course there's an element of personal responsibility but the fact is that we live in an environment where people are bombarded with advertising all the time where processed foods are cheaper and i i, th I just think it's un fair to blame people for this and I think really whatever works and if this works I think the NHS should fund it Heather um, It became a bit of a craze in Parliament for and it, it, when it was the boys that was doing this having these jabs and they're about £170 a throw and they £73 lost a month Corey tells me yeah. but, but obesity costs the NHS £6 billion pounds a year Absolutely and the weight that some of the lads have lost is phenomenal I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. Lads, as opposed to lasses as uh, well. The, the, I've never, I've not heard of any of the girls doing it. It's only the boys. It's really quite interesting. However, Nick Thomas Simmons <laughs> is an absolute. His body is a, a temple. <laughs> Tell us how you've done it, Nick. How do you worship it? <laughs> <laughs> from afar. From afar. <laughs> Nick, follow that. So, so well, <laughs> how do you follow that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, in terms of in terms of weight loss, it, it was not done in, in my particular case with injections. But I got to 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 almost exactly two years ago, actually, in March of, of 2021, and I'd, I'd always wanted to to lose weight, and I thought, well, it's all very well wanting to do it, but it's about time just act and do it. And over a period of four months, I managed to lose just over three stone, wow. which, uh, and it was done so by... I don't ever remember you being fat. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> no, seriously. I, but I, I did it by, they, they call it the, the keto uh, diet, which is essentially low carb, but you, you can eat other things. And although I eat more carb now to keep the weight that I've reached, it is still, still, still a discipline. Uh, with regard to the injections, uh, I, I do support the, you know, the clinical judgment of the NHS, but this 
obviously can't be a substitute for a longer-term strategy. You do have to have a longer-term strategy to tackle obesity, look at healthy eating and all the other things that, that go with it. It's vital that that goes on. I don't on. know why you pointed at Christina there. <laughs> He's just she admitted she that she's made, not a healthy eater. <laughs> I was certainly not. I don't want anyone monitoring my diet. Thanks very much. Um, um, we've got the most wonderful guy up in South Derbyshire called Jody, who went from 31 stone down to I have no idea what I mean if he's on 15 stone I'd be amazed and now he's um, a personal trainer Wow. And and he um, does uh, uh, sessions at both of our two leisure centres. Well, so we've got three leisure centres now in South Derbyshire. But um, I mean, he's absolutely a joy, and and he, the the joie de vivre that absolutely flows out of every pore is just wonderful. nothing like the zeal of a convert, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I will talk him up. Isn't that, very, none Claire. of that's happening with me. <laughs> very, very quickly, we want to untangle a number of things. I mean, actually, people who are overweight are not. It's not routinely that they're all unhealthy. I think it's very important to state that because you can scare people, right? I mean, you, you, you know what it's like when you go to the doctor and they go, "You are, mm. you're, you're, you're," you know, they give you a lecture basically. Well, that's if you get to the doctors. But I'm saying when you did. Mm. So I think we don't want to overstate it. It can be a serious health problem, though. And in that sense, if there's a miracle injection and the NHS can help people, then and it's going to improve the, the, their lives and, and so on. And this is not being given to everybody, by the way. Mm. I mean, I'm amazed here there's a fad round and Parliament and the boys. I mean, well, I've never heard of it before. There's that. But I think that's slightly different mm. because I think that people can't... On, on personal responsibility, of course people should take personal responsibility, but, I mean, I'm like in one of those WhatsApp groups, like, we're, <laughs> anyway, with a lot of people who are obsessive about losing weight, right? And they find it hard... Right, and I kind of on occasion I just say, "Can't we just relax and enjoy?" And just or just be I love Carver. Group. No, no, but they're my mates. But I mean, all <laughs> I, what I'm trying to say is, I understand that it can be very hard to be disciplined. That's the point I'm making, yeah. right? It can actually destroy you, joie de vivre. You know, you you actually become obsessed yes. with your body weight, and I I do worry that we sort of say to kids, you know, there's obesity, obesity everywhere, everyone's unhealthy. And at one point, we were measuring and weighing children in primary mm. school. I mean, if anything was going to make you body conscious, it has to be that. And I think that, therefore, I'm I'm just a bit. I don't want to over panic about obesity, but where it's a clinical problem, great, there's a drug. Or a, a Christine, drug. you're absolutely right about self-discipline because some people have it, some of us don't. And like when when southeastern trains change their timetable, so I now have to get a train 20 minutes later than I would have done before when I leave the studio. What do I do? I go into MS Food and buy a big packet of mango chutney poppadoms. Yeah, I, I mean for me it's kind of it's like every it's day. It's more your choice day. of indulgence. No, it's like every day and every week. I think uh, I put on weight during the pandemic. I'm obviously not fat, but I put on weight, you know, during the pandemic. And every week I think I must lose that half a stone. And and then every single evening when it comes to time for a glass of wine and crisps right. I can't be bothered Corey's saying enough fat talk let's get on to another <laughs> caller um, thank you Pauline let's go to Stephen in East Grinstead hello Stephen hi good evening Ian. good evening panel hi um, my question is will Operation Save Big Dog prevent the po political neutering of Boris Johnson by the Privileges Committee now Operation Save Big Dog this has happened before and it didn't work last time what, what do you think is going on here Stephen. No, he's gone. Um, Heather, Operation Save Big Dog, are you aware of this operation? Absolutely not. Uh, first time I've heard of it. But, I mean, Boris Johnson could be in serious trouble if the Privileges Committee does find against him. Um, there are all sorts of punishments that oh, they could there go there out absolutely are. For, for anybody that's up um, against the Standards and Privileges Committee, um, I, I sat on it for about two and a half years, and I was astounded at... Uh, what the things that our lovely colleagues used to get up to. But um, the truth is the wording is knowingly misled and um, Boris says he didn't knowingly mislead and I don't know how you prove he knowingly misled. So um, I think it's going to be a fascinating session of, uh, of, of, of ed evidence giving. But um... Nick? I think we need to let the Privileges Committee do its work. I mean, the last version of Operation Save Big Dog was not exactly a stunning success, so I wouldn't really show much optimism to Mark II of Operation Save Big Dog. But there is a, there is a serious point 
uh, at stake here because at a particular moment in our national story, when people were making incredible sacrifice and following the rules, our Prime Minister of the time was not and indeed has already received a fine from the Metropolitan Police. But there's also this huge issue of having knowingly misled Parliament. And that is a huge issue because it's the... It's the how, mechanism says, got... how do you prove that? How do you prove that it was knowingly misleading? Well, what you have to do is look at the objective evidence. I'm sure they'll be looking. We've seen more photographs this week. And, we, and then the committee members will have to ask themselves, looking at the photographs, what was it he was likely to have known when he made that comment? It was in... Uh, the, it was the December, wasn't it, when he said he'd been repeatedly reassured. But also, it's the Prime Minister's own evidence to the Privileges Committee, which we've not seen yet. It'll be for the Privileges Committee to go through all the evidence they've assembled, put it to <coughs> him, and make a judgment as to what he says to them. Christina. Well, I think... Um Obviously, I'm not the Privileges Committee, but on from what we've seen so far and what they released in that report last week, and they said that it looked as if on four, at least four occasions, he might have, he may well have misled um, Parliament. I have to say that on the basis of those WhatsApp messages, it looks to me as if he did, because um, there were a number of messages that were saying things like, well, I'm struggling to see how we can justify this one, and someone saying, uh, well, it looks as if the PM had a piss up, and someone else saying, well, you know, hard, hard to argue with that. I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember the exact I think the words. word you were searching for was party. Party. <laughs> Sorry, I do apologise. But actually, the, the precise words used in the WhatsApp know, were, were not it's party. Just, it's 15 minutes to go till the watershed. <laughs> oh, 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 apologies. <laughs> um, but I think the key thing here is that Boris Johnson made the rules. They were very clear. You were not allowed to mix with people socially during that time. And as we know, people missed saying goodbye to people who died. They missed weddings, they missed funerals, they missed all kinds of things because of the rules. And we do know that repeatedly large groups of people with suitcases of alcohol were jammed into offices. It was so evidently against the rules. And when Boris Johnson apparently said, um, uh, I was reassured that, we now know from the WhatsApp messages that that was not a policy thing, that was a PR thing. You know, someone said, oh, how do we defend this one? And he's and someone came up with some, you know, kind of crackpot theory as to how it could be defended. It was absolutely clear from the start, from when Partygate broke, that the rules were being consistently broken at Downing Street. Boris Johnson lived above the office, walked through those gatherings, allegedly joined a number of those gatherings, as well as the ones the one for which he was fined. So it seems to me that the evidence looks pretty strongly as if he did mislead Parliament. That's enough from Potty Mouth Patterson. Let's go to Claire Fox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God, I can't bring myself to be over-animated. And that's partly because I've read those WhatsApp messages. And if you want, the shocker for me is how many people are involved in misleading Parliament knowingly and what I'm more worried about is them misleading the public I mean they have conversations you know we I don't want to repeat the whole WhatsApp message saga but you know can we ramp up the fear you know or you know is there a new variant we can use all of this sort of stuff and they were a small handful and by the way for me the shocking thing of that period was I'm um, you know I'm not interested in defending big dog I mean even the thought you know but I, I'm also not interested in throwing him to the dogs I mean I just feel there was much more serious stuff going on here and the thing that I'm still horrified by was that the reason why that whatsapp group contains just a handful of people in it is because actually parliamentary democracy and civil liberties were suspended for which which every party went with, right? I mean, everybody voted for the Coronavirus Act. When I tried to raise objections, okay, minor objections to some aspects of lockdown being disproportionate, I was treated like I was some conspiratorial lunatic and, you know, and called horrible names by fellow parliamentarians who were baying from all sides of the House. Why well, I'm saying it's not party political. So it's that. I also think at the moment that there is so much cynicism in between the... I'm not, I'm not but between the Sue Gray controversy, just on the one hand, the, the who's lied, the WhatsApp messages. <clears throat> I suppose I'm just concerned that the whole body politic is being treated very 
cynically by the public and I'm worried about that, what the consequences are, so I'd rather not be overly doing it. I mean, it's up to the Privilege Committee. They should do what they mm. think is right, right? Well, also, it's just been released that... Uh, a study of the Register of Members' interests for the first six weeks of 2023 reveals that Boris Johnson made 85% of all the outside earnings of all MPs, £3.7 million. Matt Hancock is the second biggest earner at 378000 But he did give 10000 to charity, so that's all right then. 8.48. LBC. In a... Simmons, Heather Wheeler, Christina Patterson and Claire Fox with us answering your calls. Now here's an interesting one because we're going to be talking about this subject after nine. Barbara in Poole has sent in a text question saying, if we really care about the freedom to protest in this country, mm. should silent pr pr prayer really be banned outside abortion clinics? Now, um, there's a lady who was arrested and uh, because she was doing a silent prayer outside an abortion clinic as a form of protest... And she was asked to move along. She refused to, so she was arrested. And um, some Tory MPs put down an amendment to some legislation and they, they've lost this amendment, which would have then allowed this to happen. But it all goes back to the fact that protests outside abortion clinics, although there's a sort of um, a, a distance within which you are not allowed to protest nowadays. So there's all sorts of different aspects to this. Um, Heather, let's come to you first yeah. on this. Um, it's a very difficult one, isn't it? It is a very difficult one. And, and um, it was one of those occasions in Parliament when it was a free vote, uh, because it's a matter of conscience. So um, I completely uh, respect the right of women to choose. I think um, there are times when abortion is absolutely uh, a must, uh, so I'm not against that, And um, but I voted for the amendment because I thought it was utterly ridiculous. You've seen the video 
of the policeman and the policewoman um, talking to this woman who is physically there on her own. She's got no placards, no, you know, um, uh, halo, you know, shouting at people or anything like that. She's literally just standing there. And they're saying to her, what are you doing? I'm praying. Um, you're, you're praying silently, yes, because you're not saying anything. Yes, I'm praying in my head. And, you know, and that's it. And she was arrested for that. I just can't believe that we've come to that in this country. It's just wrong. And I genuinely think that they've misinterpreted the, the, the rules. I genuinely do. Claire? So, it, actually, this is an amendment that's changed the law and says that there will be now buffer zones around any medical establishment that has abortion facilities, whereas before it was only local councils, public space protection orders. So let me make it clear. I, I am an activist when it comes to women's rights to abortion. And I think that the people who are on vigils, praying outside and so on, outside abortion clinics, are distasteful and cause a lot of aggravation. Uh, or not aggravate, or, you know, uh, distressing for people. Mm. It's horrible. And, and you know, I think the kind of silent praying, you know, if you've got your rosaries and you're basically implying, I think all that. However, I support the right to protest for everyone and try and be consistent. And this was brought in in the public order bill. And so I argued, I actually put forward amendments on this to try and stop this happening. I lost mm. in the Lords because I think that you've got to be consistent. And um, like I said on free speech, can't just say support the right to protest, but not those people. And so I, I, it's interesting. It's a dilemma. Oliver has tweeted: um, Are people praying, protesting? I mean, that, 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 that's well, an that interesting kind of, one, isn't no. It? Well, what's happened is, is that there's vigils outside abortion clinics in some areas where they're kind of praying and put leaflets in and so on and so forth. And it's sort of a, a, to make the point, and as I understand this, the anti-abortionists have been doing sort of going into these buffer zones and standing there silently. The police have arrested them. It's a worrying thing, right? It's a thought crime. And even though I know that they're doing it to make a point, and I don't support their aims in relation to abortion, I think we have to be worried when the state and the police can arrest people, even if they're having a, an anti-abortion abortion vigil right anyway i know that all my my pro my pro abortion mates I, i've had more arguments over this than anything else that i've been involved in politically for quite some time and you've had a few arguments in i've had <laughs> the odd one christina well this is really difficult actually well i mean not actually obviously we know it's difficult but i think everybody has the right to believe what they like in their head everybody has the right to pray in their head i think personally if she was standing there silently and it wasn't evident what she was thinking doing or praying well I she, she it, was a repeat offender this had was happened a repeat before offender. well it is it well it's happened twice yeah i i don't know how the police use their judgment on those occasions mm. i think it's very very difficult but i think i would probably uh on the side of caution in terms of um arresting someone in that situation because I think to I think if you're literally being arrested for what is going on in your head, yeah. I think that is probably crossing a line. Nick? Well, I do support the policy of buffer zones, and I did vote uh, accordingly and have voted previously uh, in Parliament on that because I support the rights of women to have safe and legal access to yeah, uh, an abortion. Uh, and there are there are many examples of where in our public order legislation we do there are public space protection orders mm. that exist already. Uh, often with protests, there's the what, what's called kettling, where the you know protest is actually <coughs> limited to a certain route. And I think that this is in that line uh, of law where you do put these uh, these restrictions in place. And I think it's appropriate to do so, whatever the form of protest is, outside uh, clinics that offer abortion services. Um, I should say, the woman involved here, Isabel Vaughan Spruce, is going to be speaking to Nick Ferrari at breakfast here on LBC tomorrow morning. So do make sure you catch that. Uh, and we are going to be talking about this subject uh, for the next hour on LBC. So we very keen to hear your views on what our panel have said. Now, our final fun text question for the end of the programme from Julia in Cambridge. It is International Women's Day. Uh, which woman throughout history would each of your panel like to go for dinner and drinks with the most and why? Um, who would like to kick us off? Well, I think Elizabeth I would be absolutely fascinating. She was the answer to that question, that I, a, a similar question that I gave last time. Oh, night. really? So well oh, that. really? You've, you've redeemed your potty mouth there. <laughs> Good few. <laughs> why? 
Oh, because I mean, how fascinating at a, at that time of history to be to be the monarch and to be such. Have I mean. A, she was so incredibly highly educated and, um, you know, to, to be running a country, to be, um, I think she's an enigma. I would love to, I would just love mm. to find out okay. more about what I'm done in And her. did she have wooden teeth? Claire? <laughs> uh, Hannah Arendt, who I adore, who is a philosopher and fantastic thinker, and every time I read her, I just am in awe of the way she thought and because she, she uh, fought fought the Nazis if you know, she was Jewish and a victim of it but she also said unpalatable things about the nature of evil but I also want to say because I think it's important I would also want to go to dinner with J.K. Rowling right because I think as a modern day heroine well, you set the cut I know but we started well. with it and it is Women's Day and I think it's important because I actually think women's rights are on the line I sat next to her at a wedding breakfast oh, oh I would be so fun I'd be hopeless she, she was a little worse for work Oh, right. oh, um, Heather. Yes. Not as a um, writer, but as a... I, I'm going to go for somebody completely different, because the obvious thing for me to say is Maggie Thatcher, isn't it? But I have actually sat at a dinner with her already, so that probably counts. And she oh, was right. very boring, wasn't she? Not at all, not at all. <laughs> um, we talked about pearls, darling. So um, <laughs> what, what else are you going to talk about? But um, the... the uh, was it um, the, the lady um, airline pilot that eventually got lost going to Australia? Um, and they've never found a plane, did they? Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. Oh, yes. I would have thought yes. she would be a fascinating oh, yes. person yes. to catch up oh, with. Oh, you thought they're very yeah. imaginative. Nick? Why don't you have a very personal answer to this question? Because I, I tweeted this morning, actually, on International Women's Day about my grandmother, my maternal oh. grandmother. And she is the person who inspired me to enter politics. Me too. No. When no. I, not your grandmother. Not my grandmother. <laughs> and her name was Alwyn Thomas. And I had conversations with her when I was... 9, 10, 11, 12, and we used to have all these discussions, and she said, the discussions are all very well, but if you want to change things, mm -hmm. you've got to go into politics. Now, she died just before my 18th birthday, oh, and I would same love... Same here. Oh. It, it's very similar, you see. Yeah. I would love, you know, nearly 25 years later, with the experience I now have of being a politician, mm. to Talk actually to have that... Yeah. I bet oh. she didn't say the same thing to you that my grandmother said to me at the age of 12. Never trust Labour because they spend more money than they can afford. She and, certainly didn't And say Michael that. Foote's a communist. <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've never forgotten it. Uh, Nick, Heather, Claire and Christina, thank you very much for taking part in today's Cross Question. Coming up in the next hour, as I say, we are going to return to the subject of the, the, the dilemma that... I I think we all have when we balance up the right to protest against the right for women to go into an abortion clinic and not be disturbed, not be distressed by the experience of seeing protesters outside. Um, you've already heard the circumstances here. Do you think that this woman who was praying, now I don't know whether you class praying as a protest or not, but the police clearly did, they arrested her. And um, there are attempts to change the law now. Which side of this debate do you fall on? 0345 6060 973 is the number to call here on LBC. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the Labour leader has accused Rishi Sunak of being deluded over his plan to ban migrants arriving on small boats from claiming asylum in the UK. Sakir Starmer insists similar schemes have failed before, but the PA 